the talk I'm going to do today is about uh, what we've been doing the last uh, year uh, using uh, basically uh, laser capture microdissected samples to study uh, the Gleason grade in prostate. And the, I will give you a little bit of background uh, about what uh, basically are the problems in, in, uh, in treating and diagnose, uh, diagnosing uh, prostate cancer. And I will give you basically uh, a summary of our goal and the approaches that we follow to, uh, to tackle the problems that I will talk about. Uh, I, will, I will touch on the methods and the material that I've been using, and then I will give you the result and the future perspectives. So, uh, the prostate is a, is a gland that is located uh, just below the, uh, the bladder, and is disease prone in the sense that there are many, many diseases that uh, occur in, in the prostate, mostly uh, the benign hyperplasia, the prostatitis, and, and cancer. And from the anatomical point of view, the prostate can be uh, basically divided into, into three uh, areas, what is called the transition zone, uh, <coughs> the central zone and the peripheral zone, uh, which actually uh, are relevant be because it is basically different the kind of disease that is developed in each one of these zones. So in the, in the peripheral zone is where actually the, the most uh, uh, cases of, of ca carcinoma occurs, while in the central zone and in, in, in the traditional zone, which are easier to access uh, uh, through basically the urethra and the biopsy is where uh, BPH is found most. So from the diagnostic point of view, uh, when, <coughs> when uh, the, the, the prostate is biopsy, it, there is a, a, a bias toward regions that are in, in, uh, enriched for benign disease compared to uh, 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 aggressive disease. And this is uh, one of the problems that actually uh, prompt us to, to study aggressive disease in, in, in prostate, and I will explain you why a little why. Uh, as any like gland, there are cell compartments in, in the prostate. Uh, we have a, a strong compartment that you can see here that basically contains smooth muscle, nerves, the blood vessel, and then there is the, the epithelium, uh, which made up the, the, the glands. And in the process, there are so far two uh, cell types, the luminal cell and the, and the basal cells. And an intermediate phenotype is, has not yet been found, and there are few and, uh, uh, neuroendocrine cells uh, in, in, in the epithelium. So from the point of view of, of the epidemiology, uh, it's estimated that there will be about 200,000 new diagnoses of prostate cancer in uh, each, this year, last year, have been uh, about uh, 190,000, and about 20,000 uh, <coughs> new deaths because of prostate cancer. It's, it's the second common uh, cause of cancer-related uh, death in men, and for, for men, the sad news is that one in, in, in six will probably de develop it in, in, in the lifespan. Over, over time, basically, uh, the, the, the history of prostate cancer, uh, diagnosis and treatment and outcome has been changed. And the, the, the major change is, uh, can be basically figured in this red line uh, where, where basically <laughs> there is a hit per 100,000. When in 91, basically, PSA screening was, was uh, introduced. And what you can see clearly is that after 91, there has been a, a steady decrease in, in, in the death rate. Uh, so what basically is, is going on now is that uh, at some point, at some age, uh, men start doing PSA screening. If there's, a, there's a, an elevation, uh, a, a series of actions are pumped. And the, the main action is basically repeat the exam and then go for a, for a, a biopsy to see actually what is in the prostate. Uh, from the treatment point of view, uh, until, until the drugs were available for benign uh, uh, hyperplasia, uh, prostatic hyperplasia, most of the, of the surgery on prostate was for, for very large prostate due to BPH, 
that were basically causing obstruction and so people was uh, in there uh, uh, to have the prostate taken out and basically relieve the obstructory symptoms. After uh, basically uh, therapy became avail available, uh, the surgery has shifted and now basically uh, radical prostatectomy when, when the prostate is taken out uh, is only do done for cancer. So, uh, but the point is that uh, not all the, the cancer, the prostate cancer are, are going to kill a patient and there is the concern that uh, most of, a, a fair large number of patients is, is actually overtreated. Uh, there's been a, a, very, a very good uh, uh, publication on a, on a randomized trial done in Sweden, and the, the paper is Schroeder and, and, and all in, in New England Journal of Medicine, where basically they look at low grade disease, and I will explain uh, what I mean by low grade disease. Uh, uh, in the next slide, but basically when, when, a, when a cancer can, can, can be deemed to be not aggressive and people are randomized either to surveillance, watchful surveillance, so nothing is done apart from following the PSA and repeat the biopsy, or prostatectomy, which is basically a, a quite a invasive surgery, there's no difference if, if the cancer is of low grade. So they have uh, 1,400 uh, 1,400 men, and basically in the low uh, Gleason grade, uh, in the low Gleason uh, score, so the lowest uh, uh, grade for, for aggressivity in, in cancer, only one death occur for, for, uh, in, in, in that group when, when nothing was done. And, and so this raised the concern that maybe for some of the patient, surgery is too much, and, and something must be done uh, to avoid very bad side effect like impotence and incontinence which are associated with this kind of surgery because uh, the nerves control uh, this physiologic uh, function are just next to the prostate and it's, it's quite difficult to, to, to basically spare the, the neurovascular uh, bundle. So the, the question is who should be treated? And how do we basically uh, decide which patient should, should undergo a right prostatectomy, which patient could simply uh, stay on a, on a medical therapy and, and do not get any surgery? And for the patient that actually have an aggressive cancer, how do we treat them? Because apart from uh, androgen ablation, uh, there's nothing else really that works when, when this patient develop metastasis. So everything in sorting out patient in, in prostate cancer is basically uh, related on Gleason uh, grade and Gleason pattern. So this is the, the grading scheme that was developed by, by Gleason like 40, 50 years ago in 66. And it's simply based on, on watching from at, at the low uh, magnification the, how the gland appears. And what Gleason realized is that in a, in a cancerous prostate, there are basically different patterns that can be divided in, in uh, what is called like a Gleason grade that goes from one to five, where the, the, uh, <coughs> the shape of the gland is, is basically progressive, uh, progressively lost and, and <coughs> uh, and through that progression, what is, what is basically uh, going on is that a gland le gets less and less uh, distinguishable. Uh, some like uh, cells start to invade uh, alone. And, and what basically Gleason uh, realized is that if you look at over a series of, of uh, sections of the prostate, uh, you can find cancer where uh, the majority of the of the of the section contains just one pattern, or you can have combination of this pattern. And actually, by summing what is the, the, the major pattern that is found in the prostate with the second pattern, uh, he Gleason defined what is called the Gleason score or the sum, and this has been an unbeaten prognostic factor in, in prostate cancer. So simply because we have 
pattern from 1 to 5, the Gleason score cannot be any lower than 2 and cannot be any higher than uh, 10. In, in after prostatectomy, it, 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 it is also possible to have a, a complete and throughout investigation of the whole gland. And so sometimes also a tertiary pattern is recorded. And this pattern is always relevant, only relevant if it is of high grade. So the, the most important message is that basically uh, a Gleason 6 or lower never kills a patient. While a Gleason 7, Gleason 8 uh, and higher are associated with development of metastasis after 10 years. So uh, what is really relevant is to distinguish which patient can be uh, classified as low grade as Gleason 6 or which patient cannot in order to decide what, what to do in terms of treatment and follow-up. And the major problem is that given the anatomy of the prostate and given the fact that uh, core biopsy are basically a sampling, and even if multiple samples are, are taken out from the prostate, it is possible to miss the region. The problem is that some of the patients that are Gleason 6 are actually upgraded at prostatectomy. So they develop a cancer and somewhere in the prostate that was not like biopsy, there is a higher grade. So uh, still to distinguish the low and non-aggressive disease from the high grade disease is, is relevant. Even, even though Gleason grading is working wonderfully, as you can see here. So this is based on uh, 10,000 patients that are in the, in the Brady uh, database at Hopkins. And this is patients that were basically taken out from the database after PSA was introduced. And what was looked, it was whether they uh, develop uh, uh, PSA recurrence after prostatectomy. And what you can see is basically that what in, Gleason, in the Gleason 6 group, in the low uh, grade group, uh, the, the, the PSA recurrence is very low. And while Gleason sum, Gleason score increase in, Gleason seven, in the Gleason 7 group like here, or in the Gleason 8, the, the <coughs> proportion of, of PSA recurrence increase. And this is parallel uh, by metastasis-free survival, which basically is 100% in the low Gleason 6 group. And it, it drops like to uh, 78 or 70, no, 73 or 72 percent in the high grade group, or in the, in the death rate by uh, basically stratified by Gleason score. So as you can see, if you take a patient in this group, uh, the likelihood to be alive is basically 100 percent after 20 years from surgery, and that's likely probability is really different in the other group. So to, to understand what is different between these two groups it is basically our goal. We would like to understand what are the, the, the pathway that distinguish these two uh, group of patients, these two uh, uh, cancer, type of, uh, type of cancer. We would like to do so for uh, a number of reasons. First of all, because we would like to understand what is biologically different between the two uh, cancer. We would like to use the genes that are differentially expressed between the two groups to, to develop biomarkers that could be used in immune chemistry to distinguish patients that have <coughs> a pattern that is not really clear because in, in, a, in a pathological section, what can happen is that basically the section uh, can basically uh, make some glands that are normal look like uh, small uh, Gleason 8, pattern 8 uh, glands, while uh, if we could label them uh, using a, 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 an antibody, uh, stain them uh, and distinguish them, we, we might spare uh, <coughs> surgeries to people who to, do not need it, or we could uh, have people uh, sent to the operating room if they actually have a a high-grade disease. Finally, if we have some markets, we could develop prognostic tests that work, that are less invasive, that work on urine, urine goes through urethra, so if there's some invasive market, it's likely to, to find that in, in the, either in the blood or in the urine. 
So there are, there are many, many reasons to, to study uh, what are the difference between the low group, the Gleason score group six, and the high group, the Gleason score eight. And the way we decided to do is that we wanted to be as clean as possible. And for this reason, uh, we decided to do gen uh, genome-wide expression analysis using laser capture microdissected tissue. And we started from the epithelial cell, which are actually the cancer cell. And in the future, we would like also to extend this kind of uh, characterization also to the surrounding cell uh, in, the, in the stroma uh, part of the tissue. And we wanted to do that uh, not from frozen tissue, but from uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedding specimen, because this is the standard way uh, tissue specimens are stored in pathology departments, and there are basically archives that go back in time and for which there is follow up available. So we have higher number of cases uh, that are in paraffin, and we have the history uh, of, of these cases. So. This were our motivation and our approach. And I want to digress a little bit uh, about what kind of tissue actually can be used and what kind of source of uh, tissue can be used to do this genomic studies, not only uh, gene expression analysis. In the case of the prostate, the tissue could come from a prostatectomy. It can come from a resection, transuretral resection, that is called TERP, or from core biopsies. And the tissue could be processed uh, fresh and, and uh, rapidly frozen or could be embedded in paraffin. And if we go for, for a laser capture microdissected dissected uh, approach, we could decide to take each one of the compartments that are present in the, that, that we can actually see on the, on the slide. So there are real big differences if we choose to uh, use the uh, laser capture microdissected dissected approach uh, as opposed to taking the whole tissue specimen, process it, get the RNA out or the DNA or whatever, and, and uh, profile that, that uh, sample. In, in the first case, we will have a, what I, I call a compounded gene expression signature, where basically we have a contribution in terms of expression that is coming from all the cells, from, uh, from the mixture of cells that is present in, in the tissue. If the, the people with that approach is that we don't have any control of, about the, the, the composition of what we actually are profiling. In the case of laser capture micro uh, dissection, we can do a cell type specific uh, analysis, and we can basically obtain a clear readout of which is the contribution from each cell compartment. But we have information only from the cells that we actually profile. And so if we want to get like uh, uh, information about stroma, epithelial, uh, endothelial cell, we start to have more arrays for each case. So here is just like a, a schema of what is going on if we do a bulk tissue preparation. So uh, the cartoon shows the low-grade group here, the Gleason 7 group here, where we have basically patients that have basically a, a, a pattern 3 plus a pattern 7, or the opposite. And then the, the high group, the, the Gleason sum eight, where all the patterns are basically four. If we take and process this cancer bulk, we have a problem that while grade is increasing, stroma, is, stroma content in the tumor is decreasing. So if we do compare these two groups, we actually are comparing pure patterns. We are also comparing different content in stroma. So uh, stroma is probably doing definitely something uh, in, in, in the progression from low grade to high grade, but we, we cannot actually discriminate what is this contribution from what is the, the cancer cell contribution. If we do that, we might do, we might run into some problems. So, and that is basically uh, bulk tissue. Uh, uh, st uh, study on prostate cancer from the Swedish court that was used in the randomized trial. So it's a very interesting data set. And it was published recently by Sboner and, and colleagues. And what they did is basically they got uh, court biopsy from 281 patients and they got the, the basically the formalin fix 
paraffin and bed tissue, and they perform the isoilumina uh, array without capturing. And what I did here, since they provide me uh, with a review of their tumor content, I simply look at the breakdown of the grade by tumor content. So you have one large group where the cancer content is less than 50%, and then you, you have basically 75% of the patient where the cancer content in the specimen was more than 55%. The area is actually representing how many cases there are in each group. And as you can see, Gleason 6, which is red, is highly represented in where, where there is more stroma, while uh, is not really represented in the, in the uh, group where we have more cancer. So this is basically showing you that when, when you have uh, this kind of analysis, you, you might have basically an endpoint that is confounded with uh, the, the content of stroke in your, in your tissue. But this is if I decided that the median is what I want to use to break down. Actually, if I use the real data, so what was actually reported in it, in it is even worse. So there are a large proportion of the samples that were analyzed where the, 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 the tumor content is 2%. Okay. And, and there is probably 90, where the, there is at least 90% of cancer are probably three or four patients. And as you can see, Gleason 6 is overrepresented here. And there's basically no Gleason 6 where I have cancer. So if I compare Gleason 6 and Gleason 8 in this data set, I'm comparing stroma against cancer. Is that clear? So I, I end up saying, OK, this data set is really interesting, but I don't want to really use it to distinguish Gleason 6 from Gleason 8, because I cannot. What I can do is actually, since there is fair a lot of patients with very little cancer, I can, within this patient, look at the stroma. And that is what, basically, I will think this data set is useful for. So I, I, I don't think, at least for prostate, to process the bulk tissue is a good idea. So we can go by uh, about that using capturing. So what we can capture? What can we capture? We can capture patterns or scores. So if we capture pattern and we decide to compare a pattern three to a pattern four, we can actually take this pattern out of several different scores. So we can take pattern three out of pattern six, out of pattern seven, and we can take a pattern four out of a pattern seven and a pattern eight. Then we can compare these two groups. And that is what I call a mixed Gleason pattern comparison. Or we could decide that we want to just take the extreme group, and compare the Gleason uh, pattern 4 from 8 and the Gleason pattern 3 from 6. If you think at the kaplan meier curve that I showed you, this is probably the most clean uh, comparison that we can do because we are using samples that is captured from groups that have a very different phenotype. While if we capture also from the season 7, we are taking patterns from patients that actually are in the between, and we are using information from these di diluted with the other extreme group. Okay? So in, in our opinion, if we, go, if we go by that way, we might actually get some results that are not so clear as opposed if we use a pure comparison. So guess what? We decided to do that. So we select and capture pure pattern three only from Gleason score sum six, and we capture pure pattern four from Gleason eight. And the platform that we use is Dazel Illumina because it works very well for uh, formalin fixed paraffin and medit samples. Since we are basically talking about capturing a thousand cells, making RNA and put on the array, there's no array, there's no RNA left to do any RT-PCR after that. So how do we go about the fact that we, what we observe is real? So my approach on that is, is that first of all, 
we, 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 where we get any data that is useful. If we get data, then we can use other data sets in the public domain to see whether there's some concordance. And fortunately for me, in the, data, in the public domain, there were already three uh, data sets. And I labeled them basically by the first author of the paper and by the uh, GINA session, uh, the, the GEO accession number at NCBI. And these papers were published in 2006, 7, and 2009. What I have to mention is that none of these papers actually did the pure comparison. So they didn't capture only from a Gleason 6 and a Gleason 8. They basically capture several patterns from all the spectrum of the grades that are available. So what I could do is ba was basically to curate the phenotype in this data set and try to use a pure comparison and a mixed comparison. And that is actually what I did. So this is just our uh, first cohort. We, we select 24 samples from, from the archive. Uh, we had 10 patients of Gleason 8, 14 on the Gleason 6, and we used the Daisy Lumina plasma. This is actually how capturing looks like. So we have on the first line a Gleason, uh, pure Gleason uh, 8, on the bottom line a pure Gleason 6. Before you capture, you see, you see the gland. After you capture, you, you see basically what is missing from the slide, and what is captured is actually on a filter, which will be used for uh, uh, for uh, RNA extraction. This is the other data set, the first data set where they did profile uh, uh, using LCM, and they, they had 32 samples, and they used a custom array uh, made where basically there were about 4,000 genes in triplicates, and they printed cDNA basically. And they used a two-color approach, where each sample was compared to the, uh, to the normal tissue, the benign tissue that was next to the cancer. And they captured uh, more than several patterns from basically uh, seven, eight, and nine cases, uh, and, and nine uh, cases. And what was uh, the problem is that uh, no pattern Pattern 4 was captured from a pattern uh, 8. So there was no pure Gleason 4, uh, Gleason pattern 4 that, that could be uh, used basically to compare with our data. But anyway, I use this asset. That is the second data set that used LCM. And basically, they used 32 patients and they compared 13 low grade by low grade, uh, meaning Gleason 6 patient with 19 high grade. And high grade is basically uh, any pattern more than four, but this four was coming again from a, from a mixed bag of, of several uh, Gleason samples. But in this case, at least, we could do a, a pure comparison, which is, by, as I told you, comparing six and eight. Again, also in this case, the plasma was not a commercial plasma, it was a cDNA microarray where they use a two-color approach, and they use uh, the strategy in, uh, reference uh, across all the samples. Finally, there was the third paper, uh, published in 2009, which, which was actually the largest one, with 52 samples. And the, the, the annotation of the phenotype is not so good, in the sense that uh, they define uh, their, their cases to, be, to come in from uh, low grade, at least we know that it's Gleason 6, and 27 from high grade, uh, which goes from 8 to 9. So we don't know if they capture a pure pattern, if they capture the, the, the pattern mix, but anyway, there was, there was this data set available. Uh, it was quite large, 33,000 uh, 33, transit, but corresponding to 18,000 or 18 genes, two-color design, a reference, and so I decided to use that decide to use that until I discovered that there were very bad artifacts in the data. So oh, what you see here is just uh, a sampling of uh, the way their raw data appear. 
So each one of these is, is, is what is called an MA plot. is actually the standard way gene expression data are represented. Uh, you can imagine that like a scatter plot where you, you, where you plot uh, one channel against the other in the log scale that has been uh, basically uh, rotated clockwise 45 degrees. And, and that mathematical transformation is basically uh, <coughs> creating a plot where on the y-axis you have differential expression in the log two scale. And on the x-axis, you have the average expression level. So low expressed genes would be in that region, and high expressed gene would be in, in that region. And before doing any transformation, usually data are not centered about the zero, but have some like uh, trend that depends on the intensity. But what is strange in this data is actually that you can see in some of the arrays, like in, in this one, or this one, or this one, that there are two population of points. So a set of genes has this trend, and a set of genes has this trend. So this is not normal. It's, it's called close, and it's saying that in some of the arrays, something went wrong. I've been trying to see whether these genes were uh, in some area of the array, that, and that there was some like higher background in one channel compared to the other. Nothing as such. However, if you read the paper, the methods that they use to normalize the data uh, are very uh, like, uh, sophisticated, I would say. And people analyzing the data really, if you read the, if you read the paper, that will give you the idea that they, they were knowing what they were doing. But my uh, gap feeling is that they didn't, actually, they didn't actually look at the data. Because this is what their normalization, which is called VSN, this uh, virus stabilization uh, <coughs> method, did. So after they normalized the data, they didn't take away this second cloud. And so I don't know uh, what that was basically cause, what was the cause for that, but it was anyway possible to remove it by basically performing two separate uh, normalization, one for one group of points and the other for the other group of points. And this is what actually my data looks like after I normalized their data. I took basically one group of points and normalized, I took the other group of points and normalized, and then I put them together. Now actually the data looks normalized. But still, too many, too many transformations. So I start to dig in, in, in this data set. And what you, you see here is a heat map showing the pairwise correlation between any sample in the data set. And this is a, a matrix that is symmetrical, because of course, each data, uh, <coughs> when you make it square, it gets symmetrical. And on the diagonal, you have the correlation of each, amp, each sample to itself. So the diagonal is one, red. The blue is zero. What you can clearly see here is that this group of patients, this group of cases, are very tightly correlated within themselves, among themselves, but they're totally not correlated with the other. But they're all prostate cancer, and this other group has the other, the other uh, type of uh, relationship. So what I try to see is whether that was due to some experimental factor, like the day they actually hybridized the samples. So I went into the, the file, I took out the date, which is here, and the color actually correspond to the date. And indeed, most of the samples here were performed in January, most of the samples there were performed in February. So something happened in the lab that can explain that. But the worst part is the coloring on top. The coloring on top is our group, the group we want to compare. Black and red and green. Black is normal. Red is glisten six and, glee, and green is glisten eight. Most of green tends to be in one batch and most of the red tends to be in the other batch. So if I do use this data set to compare Gleason 6 and high Gleason, I'm comparing the two batches. 
No wonder that they published, that they found 1,200 200, uh, <coughs> genes differentially expressed. So that would be 20%. It would be more or less 10%. Uh, no, the 20,000. That would be 5% of the genes on their array differentially expressed, which is within the same tissue is something that I don't believe. Nevertheless, although they had 1,200 uh, genes uh, differentially expressed, only six were in common with the previous paper by True. So something was odd. Even more odd, if you take any prostate cancer data set and you compare normal to cancer, you get at least two genes in all the data set, Epsin and Amaker. Epsin and Amaker were more in cancer than normal in this data set. So, did they mislabel the sample? I don't know. I, I rechecked three times, and I get same differential express genes they publish. So there's something strange. Nevertheless, I took this data set where it was normal and cancer, and I compared to normal and cancer in Tomlins and True, the other two data that I had. And I used to, the, to make the comparison what is called correspondence at the top plot. So I could have used correlation, but correlation use all the points. And actually, the majority of the points in a, in a, in a microarray are not changing. So what you want to see the agreement between two experiments is at the genes that are highly expressed or lowly expressed, or highly differentially expressed and, and the other way around. So this is done by cat plot. And you can imagine cat plot being simply a sequence of Venn diagram where you use larger and larger lists, and you look at the proportion of overlap. So in a cat plot, here we have the proportion of overlap, and here we have how many genes we are using, okay? The great shade area is actually confidence interval. If you are in the central, very, very dark area, it's from five to 95 confidence interval. And if you are in the white area, it's basically here, less than one at the minus six, ten, and here is basically more than 99.999. So what you can see is that the green line, where I compare differential expression between cancer and normal for the true data set and the Tomlin's data set, I have an agreement that is far more than chance. When I use the Prezinotti uh, paper, I either have an agreement that is basically like chance or even less than chance. So something is really uh, uh, strange in this data set. After I've, I've been seeing that, I decided that it was really not useful for my purposes of validating our sum. But how do you go about comparing data set? You can do very fancy stuff, or you can do very simple stuff. So I decided that if I want to compare three data sets, I want to see first the simple things. And the simple thing is looking at the Venn diagram. And here is basically is our cord, the true data set, and the Tomlin's data set, how many genes are in common. It's a little discouraging, right? So you have to, to look at what is written here. What I'm using is high versus low. So they have pure pattern, and in their data set, they had a mixed bag. So in this comparison, in, in this data set here, in this data set here, I'm using all they label as high grade and all they label as low grade, okay? And then I look at the intersection. And if you look at what is the probability of having that intersection of genes, which is basically between these two or these two or these two, the, pro the probability, the p-values are very high. So what if I take less samples, but from the extreme group in these two data set, in, in Tomlin's and in, rather than use all their samples, I use only the samples that are coming from a pattern six, or a pattern eight, and I can, or a primary pattern four from a seven, and a pattern eight, and a pattern nine when the pattern four is the primary one. This is what happened. I should lose power 
okay? I, I'm using less samples, so I should be able to detect a smaller effect size. But actually, I get more genes in their, in their da data, and the amount of overlap jumps up, and the p-values goes down. So I'm, I'm getting in the overlap more genes than what is expected by chance. I'm using less sample and getting more genes. So probably the fact that we're using this intermediate group and we are, we are, and we are using that in, in the extreme group is something that is not helping comparing the two groups. Actually, is actually adding heterogeneity and we get less power, not more power. Uh, you can do that for the three data set and the total number is very low because since this data set has only 4,000 genes, we can look at only at, at, at total intersection of the three platform that is two, a little over 2,000 genes. If we just look at two data sets at a time, this is the intersection that we get using the mixed comparison. is close to significant. This is what we get if we get to use the pure pattern so we get more genes and we get more genes in common than the chance. And the same is true also for true, which I don't show you. Because and again, if I want to have a global picture, I can use cat plot. And here, each line is one of the possible comparisons that I can do. I can take our data to compare it with the pure data set in, in, in Tomlins or the mixed data set in Tomlins or I can take the, the mixed uh, data set in Tomlins and compare it to the mixed data set in, in True and so on. So what you want to look here is that the blue line is where we compare ourselves, our data, to True using the pure capturing is always higher than when we use the B, uh, which is the B line when we use a mix, uh, a mix uh, capturing scheme. And the other line that you want to follow is basically the, the, the light blue line, this one, which tends to be more than the <coughs> D line, which is where we combine here. So being here is being that the probability is basically uh, more than uh, uh, 19, this is 95, 99, this would be 99.9. So still, even if we are in the, in the gray, gray area, we are we are getting more genes than chance. So if we, if we compare pure differential gene expression associated with pure pattern, we get more agreements across platform, which basically give, me an, give us the, the feeling that, that that is the, the way to go. So what are the genes that we found? Some of the genes are really interesting for uh, people doing like uh, developmental biology and cancer, like upregulating in, in GA, there is uh, JAK2, NASH3. Uh, but what is even more interesting is that some of the genes that we found are actually already published to be associated with increasing grade in, public, in prostate cancer at the protein level, like, like EZH2 or the EGFR, uh, CXR7, or HES6, and some of them have shown the uh, concordant pattern, but uh, for, for being more expressed in lower grade. So that gave us, again, another level of, of certainty about, about the, 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 basically the, the good performance of, of the platform and the, good per, and, the, and the good quality of our data. So where do we want to go next? So I said to, that I decided to start from simple stuff. And basically, the most simple way to, to look at three data set is to look at the intersection in a Venn diagram. And that actually will completely, uh, uh, will completely uh, be useless if what I want to, to get is, is basically a ranking that is taking the information across the three platforms. Okay, because what I get in the intersection is just a list that is, uh, that is there. But if I want to get biomarkers, uh, I can be simply happy by taking the ones that are in the inter intersection of the three uh, circles in, in the Venn diagram. So uh, 
one, one of the future direction is actually to take more, uh, more uh, complex uh, approach like integrative correlation or <coughs> is, there is a W uh, in excess at the end or XZ, which are two methods that enables to combine gene expression data uh, across data set to obtain basically a statistics that is weighted over the, the data sets that are considered. Integrative correlation basically is really simple and is a method to reduce the gene space on the, uh, on the genes that are reproducible across the data set. And the way this is basically done is by finding the, gene, the, the correlation between each gene and the other gene within each data set and then looking at how this correlation correlates to the same intergene correlation in the other data set. So if one gene is similar, if gene A is similar to gene B to gene C in one data set, it should be the same, it should have the same behavior in the other data set. So by integration, by looking at the correlation of correlation across data sets, it's possible to identify the genes that are concordant, are reproducible. So one could look at, at, at these genes and, and look for the biomarkers there. Or XD is a hierarchical Bayesian model that basically weights uh, the, the, the gene the agreement <coughs> based on how many samples there are in each data set, how many you expect on differentially expressed. So it's a little more complex. And I already start to use that. And using the three data set, basically, the posterior probability of the model says that basically only six genes have a, a probability of being differential expressed and concordant across the three data set with the probability more than 90%, but at least six, these six genes are all in the intersection. So still probably the simple Venn diagram can do the job if I want just a list of biomarkers. The other thing that I want to do, I want to rescue the, the Presinotian data set. And one way to go about that could be to use uh, uh, the surrogate variable analysis or to limit myself at one batch, the one that contains both GLISEN 6 and GLISEN 8. The, the surrogate variable analysis uh, is basically a method that has been implemented by Jeff Leake at the School of Public Health at Hopkins and basically is, a, is, is an analysis of differential exp, uh, gene expression preceded by a P, uh, 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 principal component analysis and basically uh, the major components are taken out, provided that they are not confounded with your endpoint. And that should take care of taking out batch effect when you don't know what the batch effect is. Finally, I want to perform analysis of functional annotation, which is basically to look at pathways that are enriched in each data set and to see how many of them are concordant. I already did the, the, the enrichment analysis for the intersection of the Venn diagrams. And for instance, notch pathway is one of the pathways that came up. But I, I still haven't done a separate analysis uh, of functional annotation, which is uh, basically running a Wilcoxon uh, on, each, on each ranking with different pathways and getting a p-value back, which is what uh, another popular method uh, is doing, uh, the method is called gene set enrichment analysis. And then after I get this p-value from each data set to see whether there is any agreement in the pathway that are individually enriched in each data set. Definitely add more cases. And start to do some class predictions. So if we get the, the, the markers, we can, we can use them to build models that will enable us to basically make a classification into a low grade or high grade for the next patient that comes in. And again, the, the methods I plan to use are very simple, just because I like to, to start from simple stuff and want to reinvent the wheel. And TSP tends, stands for top score pair and TST from top scoring triplet. So you can classify a patient just look at the ordering of two genes. So if gene A is, is greater than gene B, then it's class one. If gene B is greater than gene A, then this is class B. And Donald Gieman uh, implemented that into a, into a, you know, to, 
into formal math, and Jeff Lick again make that into an NR package, so it's very easy to retrieve the best top scoring pair from a data set, and then to classify new data set, new data, uh, using the, the TSP. I've already been doing a little bit of that, and of course, uh, it's sort of a, uh, a useless exercise because the, the, the genes I'm using are already coming from the three data sets, so I don't have any independent ones. So I need, I need new data. Finally, we already saw that there is tissue microarray out there that agree with us, but we would like to, to use our own TMA, to especially to see and evaluate whether these markers can be useful when a pathologist cannot make a call. So if there is a, a pattern six gland, and this, Close to that gland, there is some small uh, island of uh, small island of cells that could be classified as glycine eight, but but it may also be an artifact of the of the sectioning of the of the cancer. Then there a marker could be very useful to tell which is high and which is low. And finally, to use to start to search these markers in urine and blood, we already did a little bit of that. Uh, we use a. a set of urine that, that come from a watchful surveillance uh, cohort that is available at Hopkins, but we were just like trying to see whether we could like make a, a, a RNA measurement from the sediment, and we use a, a qPNA uh, assay that actually didn't really work, so we'll try, we're gonna try with RT-PCR. So the conclusion is that the days of platform from Illumina work with, with laser capture microdissected samples, that we have a, a bunch of candidates uh, from our meta-analysis that we're gonna carry on, that, that doing simple stuff can pay, and so I'm, a very, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very fond of easy things, and then the final message is always learn R. Obviously, I didn't do that all by myself. I have people that I, I want to, to thank here. Paul, which joined the lab in the last six months, and he's a bioinformatics uh, uh, master student, and he's sitting with me in my office. And finally, now I have a space also for him. Then Brian Simmons from the Berman lab, uh, Ted Schaefer and Ashley Roth, which are actually uh, the, the two main contributors to, to this project. Ashley is the one is the, is the one guy that can sit in front of the microscope dissecting samples for 15 hours in a row after coming out from the surgery room. So 60% uh, of this project is really was relying on his shoulder. Then from the Oncology Biostatistics Group, Giovanni Parmigiani, who's been a mentor and who's always uh, uh, advising me now from, from Boston, where he moved, Leslie Cobb for all the discussion we had on how to get a confidence interval for a cat plot. If you are interested, I can explain you how you can get there. Rob Scharf, who's now helping with the, with the Bayesian, hierarchical Bayesian model to combine the three data set, and Raffaele Rizzarri for comment and, and stuff uh, about, about my analysis every morning on the shuttle bus. So, I'm done. So you can ask whatever you want.